Action Pack for Grade 12 by Cheryl Pelteret, Liz Kilby and Judith Greet Published by House of Education Copyright Dar al Taba Wiyun House of Education 2015 Module 1 Unit 1 Page 6 Exercise 3 the History of Computers When you are using a computer, think about the technology that is needed for it to work. People have been using types of computers for thousands of years. A metal machine was found on the seabed in Greece that was more than 2,000 years old. It is believed that this was the first ever computer. In the 1940s, technology had developed enough for inventors to make the first generation of modern computers. One such model was so large that it needed a room that was 167 square metres to accommodate it. During that decade, scientists in England developed the first computer programme. It took 25 minutes to complete one calculation. In 1958 CE, the computer chip was developed. The first computer game was produced in 1962 CE followed two years later by the computer mouse. In 1971 CE, the floppy disk was invented, which meant that information could be shared between computers. The first PC, personal computer, was produced in 1974 CE, so people could buy computers to use at home. In 1983 CE, people could buy a laptop for the first time. Then, in 1990 CE, the British scientist Tim Berners-Lee developed the World Wide Web. It was not until 2007 CE that the first smartphones appeared. Today, most people use their mobile phones every day. What will happen in the future? You can already buy watches which can do the same as mobile phones. Scientists have also developed glasses that are capable of doing even more than this. Life in the future is going to see further changes in computer technology. It is likely that all aspects of everyday life will rely on a computer program, from how we travel to how our homes are heated. Module 1 Unit 1 Page 8 Exercise 2 Young people love learning but they like learning even more if they are presented with information in an interesting and challenging way. Today, I am going to give a talk about how you can use technology in Jordanian classrooms. Here are some ideas. Many classrooms now use a whiteboard as a computer screen. As a consequence, teachers can show websites on the board in front of the class. Teachers can then use the internet to show educational programs play educational games, music, recordings of languages, and so on. In some countries, tablet computers are available for students to use in class. Therefore, students can use the tablets to do tasks such as showing photographs, researching information, recording interviews, and creating diagrams. Tablets are ideal for pair and group work. Teachers can perhaps ask their students to start writing a blog, an online diary, either about their own lives or as if they were someone famous. They can also create a website for the classroom. Students can contribute to the website, so for example they can post work, photos and messages. Most young people communicate through social media, by which they send each other photos and messages via the internet. Some students like to send messages that are under 140 letters for anyone to read. Teachers can ask students to summarise information about what they have learnt in class in the same way. If students learn to summarise quickly, they will be able to use this skill in future. We all like to send emails, don't we? Email exchanges are very useful in the classroom. Teachers can ask students to email what they have learnt to students of a similar age at another school. They could even email students in another country. 
As a result, students can then share information and help each other with tasks. Another way of communicating with other schools is through talking to people over the computer. Most computers have cameras, so you can also see the people you are talking to. In this way, students who are studying English in Jordan can see what students in England are doing in the classroom while they are speaking to them. You can also use this system to invite guest speakers to give talks over a computer. For example, scientists or teachers from another country could give a lesson to the class. If you had this type of lesson, the students would be very excited. Students often use computers at home if they have them. Students can use social media on their computers to help them with their studies, including asking other students to check and compare their work, asking questions and sharing ideas. The teacher must be part of the group too to monitor what is happening. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Module 1. Unit 1. Page 10. Exercise 2. The internet is a fantastic tool if it is used correctly. However, there are dangers that people should know about. Today, I'm talking to Professor Ghanem, who is an expert in ICT, or Information and Communication Technology. He advises young people about how to stay safe on the internet. Thank you for coming, Professor. Many computers have filters which stop people seeing certain websites. Do computer filters work? Yes, they are very good at stopping access to some websites that young people should not see. However, the most important thing a young person can do is to tell their parents or a teacher if they find anything they don't like on the internet. In fact, it is not only websites that can be a problem. Social media has its own dangers as well. So, what advice can you give people about social media? It is very important that young people remember that the internet is not private. If they share information on social media with their friends, it might be accessed by other people too. Are there ways to stop other people accessing their information? Yes. On social media, you should only connect to people that you know well. Most sites have privacy settings, so that only certain people can look at your site. Make sure these settings are turned on. Why do strangers want to find out information about people? They want your information for identity fraud. If people can find out enough information about you, they can access your passwords and security settings. Then they could access your bank account, for example. So don't give out personal information on the internet, such as your address or mobile phone number. Of course, but sometimes you have to fill in forms on the internet, don't you? Sometimes you do need to give information, but only give it if it is really necessary. Do not give information to sites you do not know or trust. Thank you, Professor, for your useful advice. Later we will give you, our dear listeners, information about websites where you can find more advice on internet safety. Module 1. Unit 1. Page 11. Exercise 7. Asma is a web designer and is going to tell us about web pages. So, Asma, how do you make your own website? If you have the correct computer program, it is not difficult to create your own website. Is designing a web page like designing the page of a magazine or a book? It is a little like designing a magazine page. You need to write the content of your website page by page and design the page so it looks good. However, of course, websites are different to books or magazines. You might want music or film on your web page or links to other sites. A web building program will help you to add these features. Is it important that the web pages look good then? Well, most people think that the look of the web page is what is most important. However, studies say that it is the quality of the content and how easy the web page is to use which will decide how successful it is. If users of the web page find it hard to find the information they want, they will not visit the website again, even if the web pages look really good. Can anyone have a website? 
Yes, but of course you'll want people to see your website on the internet. For that, you need web hosting. What's hosting? Hosting is basically when a company puts your website onto the internet. Some companies require you to pay for this, others are free. If you choose to make a free hosting site, are there any other costs? Sometimes there are. Some people want a name for their website that can easily be found by people. For example, let's say you want a website about learning English. It would be hard for people to search for a website called Asma's Site. However, people would find a website if it is called I'm Learning English. This is called a domain name, and you'll need to pay to register it. Module 2. Unit 2. Page 14. Exercise 3. Complementary medicine. Is it really a solution? Most doctors used to be s k e p t i c a l about the validity of homeopathy, acupuncture, and other forms of complementary medicine. If patients wanted to receive this kind of non conventional treatment, they used to have to consult a private practitioner who was likely not to have a medical degree. However, in recent years, the perception of this type of treatment has changed. These days, many family doctors study complementary medicine alongside conventional treatments, and many complementary medicine consultants also have medical degrees. Whereas critics used to say that there was no scientific evidence that non conventional treatments actually worked, now it is more common for medical experts to recognize that conventional medicine. May not always be the only way to treat an ailment. At a surgery in London, 70% of patients who were offered the choice between a herbal or a conventional medicine for common complaints such as insomnia, arthritis, and migraines chose the herbal remedy. 50% of patients then said that the treatment helped. One doctor said, I now consider homeopathy to be a viable option for many different conditions, including anxiety, depression, And certain allergies. It provides another option when conventional medicine does not address the problem adequately. However, complementary medicine cannot be used for all medical treatments. It can never substitute for immunizations as it will not produce the antibodies needed to protect against childhood diseases. It also cannot be used to protect against malaria. One doctor said, I will always turn to conventional medical treatment first. To ensure that no underlying condition is missed. However, the idea of complementary treatments is no longer an alien concept. In my opinion, it should work alongside modern medicine and not against it. Module 2, Unit 2, Page 17, Exercise 5. We're all aware of the importance of being healthy. We know that we need to eat well and take regular exercise. However, how often do we stop and think about how much energy we waste by being angry? Anger can lead to stress and other mental health problems, and it makes it harder for us to concentrate and enjoy life. I used to live outside the city, so I would drive for two hours to get to school. There was always so much traffic. I remember I used to feel more and more angry about the traffic. I would sit there in my car, with my heart beating fast, worrying about arriving late for my class. Then I realized what a waste of time it was, being angry about something you couldn't control. I also realized how much better it was to arrive to school calm and relaxed. What did you do to stay calm, Mrs. Rushwan? I took a deep breath, held it for a few seconds, and then breathed out very slowly. Each time I breathed out, I imagined that I was pushing away all the anger, all the angry feelings that were building up, and it worked. Zainab, what do you do to control your anger? Whenever I feel myself getting angry, I count to ten. This technique gives me enough time to think about my anger and be able to control it. That's a very helpful tip. Exercise can help too. Has anyone got any other suggestions? Sammy? Yes, 
I recite some verses from the Holy Quran whenever I feel cross. I strongly agree with you. Reciting verses from the Holy Quran makes us feel peaceful and patient, and it helps us to be kind to people. In fact, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, He who is victorious over his passion at the time of anger is the strongest among you. Module 2 Unit 2 Page 17 Exercise 7 1. D. Angry 2. E. Calm 3. B. School 4. C. Exercise 5. A. Importance Module 2 Unit 3 Page 20 Exercise 3 Young Emirati inventor is going to travel the world. 10-year-old Adib al-Balushi from Dubai is going to travel to seven countries on a tour which has been organized and funded by Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed, Crown Prince of Dubai. The boy caught Sheikh Hamdan's attention with his invention, a prosthetic limb for his father. The Sheikh has taken a special interest in the boy and hopes the tour that he is sponsoring for Adib will give the young inventor more self-confidence and inspire other young Emirati inventors. Adib got the idea for a special kind of prosthetic leg while he was at the beach with his family. His father, who wears an artificial leg, could not swim in the sea as he could not risk getting his leg wet. This inspired Adib to invent a waterproof prosthetic leg. Adib is going to visit the USA, France, the UK, Ireland, Belgium, Italy and Germany, where he will be staying with relatives. However, while he is in Germany, Adib will not be spending all his time sightseeing. He will be working with a specialist doctor to build the appendage. He will also be attending a course on prosthetics and learning about different kinds of medical apparatus. Adib has invented several other devices, including a tiny cleaning robot and a heart monitor, which is attached to a car seat belt. In the case of an emergency, rescue services and the driver's family will be automatically connected with the driver through this special checking device. He has also invented a fireproof helmet. This special equipment, which has a built-in camera system, will help rescue workers in emergencies. It is for these reasons that Adiba rightly deserves his reputation as one of the youngest inventors in the world. Module 2 Unit 3 Page 23 Exercise 7 Welcome to the Science and Technology Conference. Our speaker today is Professor Wilkins. He's going to talk about robots and how the medical sciences will be using them in the future. Thank you. As I'm sure you are aware, technology is rapidly changing the way medical science is being used. We already use robots in lots of different areas of medicine. I know a lot of you in the audience are nurses. You might be wondering, Will I still be working as a nurse in 10 years' time, or will a robot be doing my job? It's true that, in the future, robots will be doing more and more jobs in hospitals. In the USA, the UK and Australia, hospitals are using robots to interact with patients after they've had operations, collect drugs from the hospital pharmacy, and even visit patients in the ward when the doctor is not available. The doctor can talk to the patient via the screen on these robots. In Japan, scientists have been working on a robot which can lift a patient off the floor and into a wheelchair. Lifting patients is one of the most difficult tasks for nurses and can be carried out as many as 40 times per day. Medical professionals hope that robots like this one will be doing a lot of this kind of work in the future. It also seems very likely that robots will be carrying out surgery too. 
there are a few surgical operations that require a lot of detailed work. For example, in cancer cases, it is vitally important to remove all the cancer cells, but leave the healthy cells in place. In some operations, scanners are used to locate these cancerous cells, and these locations are sent directly to the robot surgeon. It is also very likely that robots will be sorting and delivering drugs, a task that requires absolute accuracy and speed. So, to conclude, if you are a nurse, don't worry about losing your job to a robot. In 10 years' time, a robot will probably be working alongside you, but only to make your job easier. It certainly won't replace you. Module 2 Unit 3 Page 23 Exercise 9 1 Technology 2 Audience 3 Healthy 4 Carrying Module 3 Unit 4 Page 28 Exercise 3 the importance of Islamic achievements in history. Jabir ibn Hayyan, born 722 CE, died 815 CE. The Arab world has many famous chemists in its history, but the person who is known as the founder of chemistry is probably Jabir ibn Hayyan. He is most well known for the beginning of the production of sulfuric acid. He also built a set of scales which changed the way in which chemists weighed items in a laboratory. His scales could weigh items over 6,000 times smaller than a kilogram. Ali ibn Nafa, Ziryab, born 789 CE, died 857 CE. Ali ibn Nafa is also known as Ziryab or Blackbird, because of his beautiful voice. He was a gifted pupil of a famous musician from Baghdad, and it was his talent for music that led him to Cordoba in the 9th century CE. He was the guest of the Umayyad ruler there. He is the person who established the first music school in the world in Cordoba, Al-Andalus, teaching musical harmony and composition. He revolutionized musical theory and is also the person who introduced the Aoud to Europe. Fatima al-Fihri, born early 9th century, died 880 CE. Fatima al-Fihri was the daughter of a wealthy businessman. She used her father's inheritance to build a learning centre in Fez, Morocco. This learning centre became Morocco's top university and it is where many students from all over the world come to study. Moreover, it was Fatima's sister Mariam who supervised the building of the Andalus Mosque, which was not far from the learning centre. Al-Kindi, born around 801 CE, died 873 CE. Al-Kindi was a physician, philosopher, mathematician, chemist, musician and astronomer a true polymath. He made groundbreaking discoveries in many of these fields, but it is probably his work in arithmetic and geometry that has made him most famous. Module 3, Unit 4, page 30, Exercise 2 Coffee, chess, flying, the clock, windmills, algebra, soap, the fountain pen, crystal glasses, inoculation, checks, carpets. What all these items have in common is their origins. They all have their roots in Arab or Islamic discoveries or inventions made in the past. It was the time when Arab and Islamic rulers established one of the largest empires in history. During this period, artists, engineers, scholars, poets, philosophers, geographers and traders in the Islamic world made groundbreaking advancements in many different areas, from agriculture and industry to philosophy, science and technology, literature, music and the arts. 
it was another area of Arab and Islamic expertise, that of navigation and trade, that introduced their discoveries, inventions and developments to other parts of the world. In Al-Andalus, for example, trade and agriculture improved under Arab rule. There were huge advancements in arts and science, and Cordoba, the capital of Andalusia at that time, became the largest and greatest city in Europe. By the 10th century, Cordoba had a population of about 500,000. There were 700 mosques, about 60,000 palaces, and 70 libraries, the largest of which had 600,000 books. Cordoba also had around 900 public baths, and it was there where Europe's first street lights appeared. Just outside the city stood the magnificent Medinat al-Zahra, the royal palace. It took 40 years to build and, until it was destroyed in the 11th century, it was one of the wonders of the age. It is now in the process of being restored to its former glory. Module 3 Unit 4 Page 31 Exercise 8 A Pen Bend Back Pack Rope Robe B Song Sun Singing India Wing Win Module 3 Unit 5 Page 34 Exercise 3 the Arts in Jordan Jordan has a very rich cultural heritage thanks to the support of the Department of Culture and the Arts, which was founded in 1966 CE. Since then, the department has built up an exciting, ongoing programme of cultural activities related to all the arts. Music, visual arts, performing arts and the written word. In 1979 CE, the Royal Society of Fine Arts, RSFA, was established to promote visual arts in Jordan and other countries in the region. It has links with major art galleries around the world in order to encourage artists from different cultures to learn from each other. The Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts is one of the most important art museums in the Middle East. The collection includes over 2,000 works of art, including paintings, sculptures, photographs, installations, textiles and ceramics by more than 800 artists from 59 countries. In 2013 CE, it held Jordan's largest art exhibition called 70 Years of Contemporary Jordanian Art. Until the 1990s, most Jordanian literature was only available in Arabic. However, thanks to Prota, the project of translation from Arabic, Many Jordanian plays, novels, short stories and poems are now translated into English and people all over the world are able to read and appreciate them. Every year, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, chooses a different Arab city as the Arab cultural capital. In 2002 CE, the city of Amman was awarded this title. Jordan has a centuries-old musical heritage. The National Music Conservatory, NMC, opened in 1986 CE, making it possible for more Jordanian students to study music seriously. In 1987 CE, the National Centre for Culture and Arts was created, which showcases theatre and dance in Jordan and in the region. Realising the value of art and culture, Jordan decided to offer Jordanians and the world an annual arts festival. In 1981 CE, the Jerash Festival for Culture and Arts was founded. This three-week-long summer programme is one of the largest cultural activities in the region. It takes place in the important archaeological site of Jerash, which underlines the close relationship between the arts and Jordan's cultural history. Module 3, Unit 5, P. 
Page 36. Exercise 3. Now, do you see the textile workshop yet? No? Right. Let's take a look at that first. All of the handmade embroidered textiles here are made by local girls and women. The abundance of birds and colorful local plants found in the reserve are inspirations for many of the designs. Here, you are guaranteed to find items that are different than anything in other shops. There is also a silk screen printing workshop. Here, unique hand-painted wall hangings, cushions and other soft furnishings are produced. These are superb examples of this highly detailed Jordanian handicraft. There is also an ostrich egg painting workshop here, where once again designs reflect the environment, whether it's a delicate oval leaf or a bright red flower. The craftspeople also produce a range of wooden educational toys and games. All in all, the integration of art and nature is very clear to see in the crafts of the Azraq Wetland Reserve. Now, I'm sure some of you have gotten tired after all the walking today. Would anyone like to take a short rest? Module 3, Unit 5, Page 39, Exercise 5 The school was set up in 1922 CE and there were four main aims. Firstly, to train Jordanian craftspeople to make and restore mosaics. Secondly, to preserve the mosaic floors all over Jordan. Thirdly, to provide new work opportunities for artists. And lastly, to make people aware of the importance of mosaics as part of Jordan's cultural heritage. Students come from all over Jordan, both young men and women. To qualify to take the course, you have to complete the 10th grade with an average of 75% and above. You have to take a special entrance exam in art and general knowledge and the 15 best students are selected. The course of study lasts for two years. In the first year, students learn how to make mosaics and practice copying the details of well-known ones. In the second year, during the summer, students often go to work on archaeological sites with experts from abroad. This is so that students can get experience in practical work and in the new techniques that people use these days. The rest of the year, the students make new mosaics and restore old ones. They always leave the most important and the most precious mosaics in place. The others, if they are a reasonable size, are brought to the school to be restored. When the restoration is completed, the most important mosaics are returned to the site where they were found. Some are added to museums and some are used to decorate the outside of public buildings. When students graduate from the school, they get a special certificate in mosaic education and restoration. Some graduates go on to work on restoring the many mosaics found in the region. There are lots. And some work in tourism. Others make new mosaics, either to sell to the public or to galleries. This work has led to a lot of interest in Jordanian mosaics, especially in the economy of Madaba where they are sold. It makes the students feel proud to be able to do that. Module 3, Unit 5, Page 39, Exercise 6 A. Bean Fit Dream Give Middle Medium B And Bath Car Back Half Ran C Best Birthday Egg World Girl Death Revision A. Page 41. Exercise 2. The report also carries the warning that humans are using resources faster than the planet can restore. For example, 
We are cutting down forests more quickly than newly planted trees can grow. Overfishing is causing a marine imbalance, and pollution is becoming harder and harder to control. The authors of the report hope that this picture will serve as a wake-up call to all of us. They want to emphasize how important it is for each one of us to take responsibility for our actions and to protect our planet by thinking carefully about everything we do. Activity book. Revision A. Page 29. Exercise 2. As a young man, Ibn Rushd studied the law. He also studied philosophy and soon took up medicine too. One of his most influential works was a medical encyclopedia, Kitab al-Kuliyad Fitub, or Generalities, as it is known in the West. Ibn Rushd also wrote books on psychology, geography, physics, maths and music. From the age of 31 until his death, about 40 years later, he wrote an amazing number of books. At least 80 books of his own, as well as a large number of translations of Greek philosophy. Although the place where he died was Morocco, there is a statue of Ibn Rushd in Cordoba where he was born, and where for many years he lived as a scholar, lawyer, scientist, doctor and writer. Activity book. Test A. Page 58. Listening. We've all by now heard of 3D printers, which have been used to produce everything from toys to houses. But soon, they may be used in medicine to improve greatly patients' chances of survival. While 3D printers have so far been used to print human body parts from plastic, metal and other materials, scientists have been working on printing from living, biological material. They are already using the machines to print small organ cells and in the future it is hoped the technology will be used to print whole human organs that will be able to replace failing organs in people who are ill. The technology has already been used successfully in a few patients and there is a lot of hope for the future. Teacher's book Test A. Listening. Is homeopathy a valid alternative to conventional medicine? Can it ever be said to be effective? We have two speakers here today to debate the issue. Dr. Hurani is a well-respected scientist and Mr. Khatib is a widely respected practitioner of homeopathy. Remember, the winner of the debate is decided by you. Let the debate begin. I want to start the debate with this. There is no debate. Homeopathy is not and should not be an alternative to conventional medicine. Let's look at the facts. Medical trials have failed to show that homeopathy is any more effective than taking a sugar pill. There is absolutely no proof that it works. In response, I want to begin with the crucial question. If homeopathy is nonsense, why is it so successful? How can the experience of millions of people be wrong? Conventional medicine is failing us. Anxiety, depression and insomnia are all medical problems that are misunderstood by the medical community. How can we address these problems? I believe that homeopathy is the answer. How can conventional medicine be failing us? when people are being cured every day. Homeopathy fails the people that it says it will protect. It is a waste of money and it is dangerous. How ethical is it to ask a patient to neglect treatment in favor of an unscientifically proven remedy? How is it ethical to deny choice and limit alternatives to often outdated scientific treatments? Who has the right to deny patients the treatment that they know is best for them? Well, Let's give the audience a chance to decide. Module 4, Unit 6, page 44, Exercise 3 The time we spend at school A few years ago, 
As many as 1,000 schools across the USA started making school years longer by adding up to 10 extra days to the school year, or by making each school day longer by half an hour. This was because it was found that secondary school students in the USA and the UK were spending the least time at school, with an average school year of 187 days. The typical Jordanian school year is longer than this. However, none of these are nearly as long as the school year in countries like Japan and South Korea. South Koreans attend school for 220 days per year, and in Japan, the school year numbers 243 days. According to a study by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, students in Japan, Indonesia and South Korea spend the most time studying in the world. They want to learn as much as they can to ensure excellent exam grades. They go to school for about nine hours, although this includes optional after-school tuition and activities. They also spend about three hours on homework every day which is three times as much as many other countries. Their high academic achievements do suggest that the longer you study, the better you do in final exams. In Finland, however, students are usually given less than half an hour of homework per night, and they attend school for fewer and shorter days than 85% of other developed nations. Despite this, they achieve top marks in subjects like maths and science. In addition, most students also speak at least two, and often three, languages fluently. The contradictory views of the study suggest that the number and length of school days is not the only factor in determining whether students will succeed at school or not. Module 4, Unit 6, page 45, Exercise 7 Secondary Compulsory Organization Development Tuition Achievement Academic Contradictory Module 4 Unit 6 Page 47 Exercise 7 Hi, I'm thinking of studying law at a university in Jordan. Can you tell me what I need to know about it before I make that decision? You will be expected to do a lot of work outside the classroom, and you need to be very highly motivated. Moreover, whatever subjects you take in school, you will need to do very well in. Traditional academic subjects like history, English and social studies are good places to start. You will be doing a lot of essays at university, so any subjects that require essay writing will be useful. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I've got a question. I'd like to study dentistry at the Jordan University of Science and Technology. My favourite subjects at school are biology, chemistry and English. I'm also doing maths, of course, but I'm not that good at it. If I drop it, Will my chances of getting into dentistry be badly affected? Biology and chemistry are the most important subjects if you want to go on to study dentistry at university. Maths is not as important, but it is compulsory and I would strongly recommend that you work harder on this subject because you cannot drop it. The most important thing to remember is that, like law, to do dentistry you need to be fully committed to hard work. Expect to be in classes or doing practical work for eight hours a day, five days a week. Dentistry students work extremely hard. Any more questions? I'm absolutely passionate about business and I really want to study business management at a university in Jordan. Can you tell me which subjects are best to take at school? I'm good at ICT, but I'm not that good at maths. Is it absolutely essential? Economics or business studies are very useful subjects for a degree in business management, and so is ICT. Other good choices are history, and of course any foreign languages will help you a lot in business one day. However, I'm sorry to hear you're not doing well in maths, because although it's not vitally important to be good at it, 
it is certainly going to help you with economics, accounting and finance when you're at university. If you are unable to use maths as needed, you might not achieve everything you want to in business. Maybe you should get some outside tuition for maths. Yes, I'm thinking about that. Good. I'd strongly advise it. And remember, business management is a very popular degree and the leading universities will ask for the very best grades, so you will need to stand out from the crowd. Module 4, Unit 6, page 48, Exercise 2. Have you ever thought about studying in another country? Our student exchange program can take you to all corners of the globe. Here are the top five ways that studying abroad can help your degree mean more. 1. You can increase your employment prospects by graduating with an international degree. Employers are increasingly placing a high value on international experience. 2. In our experience, 84% of participating students felt that studying abroad helped them to build valuable job skills, such as language proficiency, cultural training and communication skills. 3. You will have the chance to study at some of the top universities for teaching and research around the world. 4. You will develop a greater understanding of your own culture and that of others, as well as meeting new people and developing lifelong friendships around the world. 5. Finally, most exchange students really grow in self-confidence and become more independent while learning more about themselves at the same time. So if you want to get more from your degree, then consider an international exchange or overseas study program. It's your passport to experiencing a truly global education. Module 4, Unit 6, page 48, Exercise 5 the German Jordanian University, GJU, is a public university near Madaba. It opened in 2005 CE. The university enrolls more than 5,000 students, who come from Jordan and many other countries. About 14% of all students are non-Jordanian. The university differs from other universities by offering German language courses in preparation for the fourth year which most students spend working or studying in Germany. The university also has a very good reputation for English and Arabic language courses. Module 4, Unit 7, page 50. Exercise 3. How to revise for exams. Do you know if it's too late to start revising now? No, it's never too late to start revising. The first thing I would do is to draw up a revision timetable. Do you mind telling me how I should draw up a timetable? Look at all the subjects you have to do and work out when you're going to work on each one. It's a good idea to change the order of the subjects in your timetable for each day. Try doing a little English, followed by some maths, then biology, and so on. This way, by changing the focus of your revision, you keep your mind fresh. Do you know whether it's best to get up early or to revise late at night? The earlier you start in the morning, the more beneficial your revision will be, because that's when you feel most awake and your memory is at its best. I'd also recommend studying for 30-minute periods and then taking a break. It's been proved that concentration starts to decrease after half an hour, so frequent breaks will help the brain to recover and concentration to return. Could you explain what you mean by frequent breaks? By break, I mean any change of activity from studying. It could be something as simple as just getting up from your desk and listening to some music or walking around for 10 minutes. Could you tell me how much exercise I need? Physical activity is very important, of course, especially when you are studying. Exercise will make a huge difference to the way you feel. The physical activity will increase your heart rate and, in turn, that will increase your blood circulation. It also sends more oxygen to the brain, which makes you revise more efficiently. Do you mind giving me some advice about diet? Nutrition is very important. You should try to eat as much fresh fruit and vegetables as you can. 
It's essential not to become dehydrated, so drink lots of water. Module 4, Unit 7, Page 51, Exercise 6 Could you tell me where I should revise for exams? I'd find a quiet place to study where I won't be interrupted. Some students say they work better if they have some soft background noise, like people talking or music playing. If that works for you, it's fine. But a lot of people prefer working in a quiet atmosphere. Do you know how much sleep teenagers of our age need? I recommend at least eight hours of sleep. I wouldn't stay up all night revising. If you do that, you will find that you're very tired in the morning and that is not advisable on the day of an exam. You'll find it harder to recall things you've learnt. Even though the information is there in your memory, it will be easier to retrieve if you're wide awake and well rested. Do you know if it's possible to improve your memory? Yes, there are several ways to help yourself to remember things. How about writing difficult words or facts to remember on pieces of paper and sticking them on the walls? You could use coloured pens to highlight certain parts of a text or draw diagrams to help you to remember a process. These are also good methods of making sure you can remember things. Many people find it helpful to make up rhymes or songs, or they use mnemonics to remember dates in history, for example. Do you mind telling me what you mean by mnemonics? It's when you use initials to spell a word that will help you to remember the order of something. For example, if you find it difficult to remember the order of musical notes written on the lines of a stave, which are E, G, B, D, F, try memorising the sentence instead. Every good boy deserves favour. Could you explain what I should do on the day before the exam? Yes, absolutely. The night before an exam, it's a good idea to prepare yourself for the next day. Make sure you've got all the details about the exam and that you know exactly where to go and what is needed. In the morning, have a nutritious breakfast and get to your exam in good time. Module 4, Unit 7, Page 53, Exercise 7 We're talking to an education expert about some of the theories that are commonly believed about the way we learn. Professor, it is said that you are either right-brained or left-brained. Could you tell me whether this is true? Well, although it is commonly accepted that we have a dominant side of the brain, which dictates how we learn, actually, there isn't any research that supports this theory. According to a study recently, however, researchers did find that certain brain functions were more likely to occur in either the left side or the right side. But they also found lots of variations in these findings at the same time. It appears that both sides of the brain are involved in even the simplest actions. Is there really one exercise that makes you cleverer? In the same way as exercise and diet, there are always new fashions in the field of learning too. It is believed that doing crosswords will keep your brain active, even when you are very old. However, there isn't a lot of evidence to support such theories. Instead, it is now thought that our brain development is dependent on the experiences we have. Experience is more important than any exercises we do. Do you agree that we only remember 10% of what we read and 90% of what we see, hear or do? No, I disagree with that completely. This theory was introduced many years ago and although it sounds as if it could be true, there has never been any research to prove it. It is often said that practice makes perfect. I agree with that. Do you mind telling me what you think? I have exactly the same opinion as you. Our brains coordinate a complex set of actions. As we repeat a task over and over again, the coordination becomes smoother and quicker. In the end, after a lot of repetition, we can perform the task perfectly, or at least almost perfectly. So in order to improve your skill at something, you need to practice frequently and get lots of feedback so that you practice correctly too. Yes, you're right. That's very important. Module 4, Unit 7, page 55, Exercise 4 My name is Asma. 
I'm doing an online postgraduate course in education. I chose this online course for several reasons. Firstly, I don't live near a university, so I can't attend classes. And secondly, I'm working as a teacher at the moment, so I need to fit my studies in around my work. So working online has the advantages of overcoming these problems. It does take quite a long time to study for the final exam. You have to have a lot of self-discipline to study on your own, in your own time. I'm really enjoying my course, and I'm going to go on to do a PhD next. I love the fact that you can continue studying, even once you've completed school or university. There's never any need to stop. My name is Mazin, and I'm doing a degree in computer science. People think distance learning means that you don't meet or socialize with other students, as you do when you're doing a face-to-face -face course. It's not true. Our class consists of 30 students from all over the world, India, Pakistan, Zambia, Sweden, Canada, Denmark, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. We study at home and send our assignments to our tutors by email. However, that does not mean that we study on our own. There are lots of different class discussions on the internet. The lecturers and tutors are always available to answer questions and give suggestions. They're very supportive. I travel a lot in my job and I have to be flexible as regards to my study time. That is only possible through online learning, so I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Module 5, Unit 8, page 58, exercise 3. Does the language we use influence the way we think? Or does our culture influence the way we use language? Sociologists have been looking into this question for hundreds of years. They have now begun to look at not just how people talk, but also how they think, asking whether the way we understand and remember experiences is influenced by language. As a result of these studies, they have come up with some interesting results. A lot of research has been carried out on the relationships between mind, world and language. In one study, a psychologist points out that when describing an event, English speakers tend to mention the person who is responsible, whereas English speakers might say John broke the vase, Spanish or Japanese speakers would use a passive form. It is believed that such differences between languages have an effect on how their speakers understand events and whether someone is blamed for an action or gets away with it. In another study, speakers of English, Spanish and Japanese were asked to watch videos of two people popping balloons, breaking eggs and spilling drinks, either on purpose or accidentally. Later, when asked to recall the videos, the English speakers mentioned the person who did the action. The Spanish and Japanese mentioned the person responsible for intentional events but left this out when they considered that event to be an accident. Scientists at Newcastle University, UK, have carried out tests to prove that different cultures also have different ways of seeing colours. They found that in Japanese, for example, there are different words for light blue and dark blue, which are not found in English. Native speakers of Japanese, therefore, made a clearer distinction between colours on the spectrum. Is it our language that has affected our way of thinking? Or has a difference in cultural habits affected both our thoughts and our language? Most likely, culture, thought and language have all come about together. Module 5, Unit 8, Page 60, Exercise 2 Hi Sammy, what are you working on? It's your English essay, isn't it? Hello, Harry. Yes, it is, and you're just in time. You did English at university last year, didn't you? Could you explain something to me? I'll try. What do you want to know? Well, I have to write my opinions on the following topic. Should we use more gender-neutral language in our writing? Well, what do you think? I'm not sure. What do you think? Ah, you don't understand what gender-neutral means, do you? Ugh, <sighs> no, not really. Okay. I'll tell you what I understand by the term, shall I? It means, wherever possible, we should try and use neutral words instead of words referring specifically to male or female gender. 
Yes, but that doesn't help me to answer the question in my essay, does it? I haven't finished yet. Traditionally, the masculine form has always been used in sentences where a gender neutral form would be preferable. Many people these days prefer to use a neutral form whenever possible. Why is that? Well, it shows that the speaker doesn't feel that certain roles are suitable only for men or only for women. So, when you are talking about a profession, for example, you should really imply that both men and women can do it, instead of either men or women. I see. So, instead of saying a businessman or a sales lady, we should use neutral words like business person or sales assistant. That's right. Use firefighter instead of fireman, or head teacher instead of headmaster or headmistress. And instead of saying something like, everyone needs to think about the language he or she uses, it's now acceptable to use the pronoun they instead of he or she. Everyone needs to think about the language they use. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I do. Thanks. You've been very helpful. You're welcome. Do you want to watch TV? My favorite program is on. I'd love to, but I can't right now. I have to start my essay, don't I? Module 5, Unit 8, Page 60, Exercise 4. A. What do you think? B. What do you think? Module 5, Unit 8, Page 60, Exercise 5. 1. I can't buy a car. 2. I can't buy a car. 3. I can't buy a car. 4. I can't buy a car. Module 5, Unit 8, Page 61, Exercise 6. 1. You did English at university last year, didn't you? 2. You don't understand what gender neutral means, do you? 3. I'll tell you what I understand by the term, shall I? 4. That doesn't help me to answer the question in my essay, does it? 5. I have to start my essay, don't I? Module 5, Unit 8, Page 61, Exercise 7. 1. You did English at university last year, didn't you? 2. You did English at university last year, didn't you? 3. You don't understand what gender neutral means, do you? 4. You don't understand what gender neutral means, do you? Module 5, Unit 9, Page 64, Exercise 3. Doing business in China. Today, we talk to Mr. Ghanim, a businessman based in Amman who often visits China. We asked him when he first started doing business with China. I've been doing business with China for many years. My first trip there was in 2004 CE, and it was not very successful. Why was it not successful? I worked for a small computer company in Amman. They sent me to China when I was still quite young. If only the company had realized that the Chinese respect age and experience more than youth. Did you make any mistakes on that visit? Yes. I wish I had researched Chinese culture before I visited the country. In order to be successful in China, you need to earn their respect. Chinese business people will always ask about a company's successes in the past. However, because I worked for a new company, I could not talk about its track record. We did not do any business deals on that first trip. When did you learn how to be successful in China? I joined a larger company and they sent me on a cultural awareness course. On my next visit to China, it felt as if I hadn't known anything on my first visit.
What advice can you give to people wanting to do business in China? Before I visit a company, I send recommendations from previous clients. I also send my business card with my job position and qualifications translated into Chinese. Can you tell us about your last meeting in China? Of course. I arrived on time. You must not arrive late as this shows disrespect. Then, when I met the company director, I shook hands with him gently. I began the meeting by making small talk about my interesting experiences in China. During the meeting, I made sure that my voice and body language were calm and controlled. I never told a joke, as this may not be translated correctly or could cause offence. Was it a successful meeting? Yes, it was. I knew that the director had researched my business thoroughly before the meeting, so I was prepared for his detailed questions. When I began negotiating, I started with the important issues. The Chinese believe in avoiding conflict. It is always important to be patient. I was prepared to compromise, so in the end, the meeting was successful. Module five, unit nine, page sixty-eight, exercise two. In 2013 CE, Royal Jordanian Airlines celebrated its 50th year at the Queen Alia International Airport in Amman. We talked to Mr. Hatib, a former pilot who tells us about the important moments in the airline's history. Mr. Hatib, could you tell us about when the airline began? The first ever Royal Jordanian flight flew from Amman to Beirut in Lebanon. In 1963 CE, in those days the airline was called Alia, after the king's daughter. Later that year, there were flights to Cairo and Kuwait City. Were the planes very different then? Oh yes, we had much smaller planes then. Because the planes were small, the duration of the flights was quite short. In 1964 CE, Alia had just two planes. Which carried eighty-seven thousand people on around four thousand two hundred flights. That sounds like quite a lot of people. Today, Royal Jordanian carries three point three million passengers on thirty-nine thousand flights using thirty-three planes. So you can see the airline has grown enormously. What other dates were important for the airline? I remember the year nineteen sixty-five CE, when there was the first flight to Europe. It flew to Rome in Italy. By 1970 CE, we began to use modern jets, and we had become the main airline in the Arab world. In 1977 CE, we began the first direct flights to New York. When did Alia change its name to Royal Jordanian Airlines? That was in 1986 CE. By then, it was flying to destinations in Asia, North America, and Africa. When did you stop being a pilot? I retired when I was sixty in 1999 CE. If only I were younger. Do you wish you were still flying today? Yes, I wish that I had the opportunity to fly the latest jets. They are now so comfortable and filled with the latest technology. How big is Royal Jordanian Airlines today? Today it flies to sixty destinations around the world and employs four thousand five hundred people. There are plans to expand routes further and increase flight frequencies. So it is a very successful business. Yes, its revenue is about seven hundred and fifty million Jordanian dinar, but the company has a good record of corporate responsibility. In what ways? Royal Jordanian supports various charities. For example, in two thousand and fourteen CE, it took two hundred orphans to visit the Children's Museum of Jordan. Every year. It helps Jordan's orphans and children with special needs. Thank you. That sounds like a real success story. Module five, Unit nine, Page sixty nine, Exercise five. One, the first ever Alia flight was in nineteen sixty three CE. Two. The first ever Alia flight was in 1963 CE. Three. The first ever Alia flight 
was in 1963 CE. 4. The first ever Alia flight was in 1963 CE. 5. Unit 9. Page 69. Exercise 8. In today's business program, we look at one of the most successful businesses in Jordan, and that is Jordan itself. Thousands of tourists want to visit the country each year thanks to its culture, historical sites, and beaches. This is good news for all of us. Tourism is one of the most important sectors of the economy. The country receives more than 3 million tourists a year, and they generate about $3 billion of revenue. This contributes 13% of the country's gross domestic product. Around 6% of the country's workforce are employed in tourism, including hotel and restaurant staff, guides, and people working for tour companies. Jordan already has a good tourist infrastructure so that visitors can easily travel to the main sites. However, the Ministry for Tourism and Antiquities is working hard to promote Jordan as a tourist destination for both the domestic and overseas market. To do this, money has been invested in some of Jordan's most historic cities, including Salt, Jarash, Karak, and Madaba. So which places do tourists prefer when they visit Jordan? Some would rather go to historic sites such as Jarash and Petra. Others prefer to see natural attractions such as the Dead Sea or the desert of Wadi Rum. Others like the beaches and diving at Aqaba. The ministry wishes that people would visit all areas of the country and not only these established destinations. Loans and grants are being given to other areas of the country to promote different types of tourism. For example, tourists can enjoy adventure sports such as rock climbing, hiking and scuba diving. Shopping is also being promoted for tourists in Amman, Aqaba and Irbid. Jordan's economy is growing by about 3% annually, but the tourism sector is growing at more than 10% annually. No wonder tourism is such an important business. Module 6, Unit 10, page 72, exercise 3. My job as an interpreter. My name is Fatima Musa and I have worked as an interpreter for five years. Many students have emailed me about my work because they want to know what it would be like to do my job. So here is my reply. I have always been fond of languages. My father worked in many different countries when I was young and we usually travelled with him. When we visited a country, I always wanted to learn the language. At school, I was very good at English. Therefore, I decided on a career as an interpreter. My job now involves going to important conferences and seminars around the world. When a person speaks in English at a conference, I listen to what they say through headphones. I then translate into Arabic while the speaker is talking. I give the translation through headphones to other people at the meeting. This means that anyone in the room who speaks Arabic can understand what people are saying. Is it an easy job? Not at all. English is not the same in all English-speaking countries. For example, the English words that are used in India are sometimes different to the words that people use in the UK, the USA or Australia. As well as knowing regional English, you also need to know a lot of specialist language. Some of the words that are used to talk about business, science or law, for example, make it almost a different language. Unless you have a language degree, you will not be able to become an interpreter. Provided that you have a postgraduate qualification, you will probably get a job as an interpreter quite quickly. If you get an interview for a job, you will need to show that you have good listening skills and a clear speaking voice. You will also need to show that you can think quickly and that you are able to concentrate for long periods of time. If you are successful, it is a secure and rewarding job. You will probably need to travel a lot, but that is not a problem as long as you enjoy visiting other countries. It is a very responsible job. I am aware that if I translate things badly, it could affect an important law or trade agreement between countries. 
However, you get a huge feeling of satisfaction when you know that people understand everything that you translate. Module 6, Unit 10, Page 74, Exercise 1 It is not always easy for young people to get a job today. However, young people represent the future of Jordan, so it is very important that they get the right jobs. With us today, we have Mrs. Asmar, a career advisor for young people. So in today's programme, you have the chance to ask an expert about work. Let's speak to our first caller, Nadia from SALT. Hello. I applied for a job in conservation. They said that I would have got the job if I had had some experience. But how can I get work experience without getting a job first? Hello, Nadia. That's a good question. Before you find a full-time job, why don't you consider doing voluntary work? You will not be paid, but this will give you invaluable experience. That sounds like good advice. Now our next caller, Ibrahim from Irbid. I have a degree in geology. But the last job I applied for asked for surveying skills that I don't have. What advice can you give? If I were you, I'd find out about training courses. These courses give young people the practical skills that they need to take into a full-time job. As you have a geology degree, you could do a course in land surveying and become a surveyor. If you had done the course, you would have had enough experience to apply for that job. Are there any jobs which train young people while they are working? Yes, many banks will train their staff in a career that can be financially rewarding. Banks also take undergraduates as interns. Internships help you to gain work experience before you even finish your studies. Thank you. OK, now we have Sami from Gerash. Can you tell me the most popular jobs for young people today? It depends on the person's interests and qualifications. Of course, many people with degrees in medicine want to get jobs as doctors or in hospitals. Others take law degrees because they want to work as lawyers and solicitors. What if you don't have a degree in medicine or law? There are often job opportunities in Information and Communication Technology, or ICT. Today, we are seeing the first generation of people who have grown up using computers, mobile phones, tablets, etc. So ICT comes naturally to many young people. This is an area where young people probably have an advantage over older people. One final question from Miriam in Aqaba. When you were young, what job would you have taken if you'd had the choice of any job available? That's a very good question. I did have the choice and I chose this one. I really enjoy helping young people to find suitable careers. Module 6, Unit 10, Page 74, Exercise 4 1. I would have got the job if I had had some experience. 2. If you had done the course, you would have had enough experience to apply for the job. 3. Unit 10, page 75, exercise 6. A. How can I get work experience without getting a job first? B. Before you find a full-time job, why don't you consider doing voluntary work? C. What advice can you give? D. Are there any jobs which train young people while they are working? Module 6. Unit 10. Page 75. Exercise 8. Mrs. Jamal, you were a manager of a small company in Amman for six years. Why did you stop working there? My husband and I decided to have children. I returned to work after my first child, but it became more difficult after the second child and impossible after the third child. If I hadn't had children, I could have stayed at the company. So when did you decide to go back to work? My youngest child was about to start secondary school so I knew I would have more free time. However, if my son hadn't become ill, I might have gone back to my first job. What happened? 
My son was in hospital for a week. I saw the wonderful work that the doctors and nurses did at the hospital. I decided to become a nurse. Was it a big change from being a manager to being a nurse? In some ways, a vocational job like being a nurse is very different. You are doing different things all the time. It is quite physical work. You don't have much time to sit down, and sometimes you have to support or move patients. In other ways, however, the jobs are similar. Really? In what ways are they similar? In both jobs, you need to be very organized and you need to work as part of a team. I think my management skills have helped me to communicate well with the patients and the other nurses. I'm also good at staying calm under pressure. I've had a lot of satisfaction from both jobs. Which would you recommend most to young people? Being a nurse or a business manager? It all depends on the individual. If you are ambitious, you should probably go into business management. You will certainly earn more money. However, provided that you don't mind a relatively low income, being a nurse is perhaps more rewarding. What could be better than seeing people get better after they have been ill? Revision B, page 79, exercise 2. Furthermore, many employers view interns as possible employees. Many interns, once they have proved that they are capable and hardworking, are offered a full time position after the end of the internship contract. This trial period also gives interns the chance to see whether they have made the right career choice. Contacts or references within an industry can really help someone applying for a job. And internships provide the chance to meet lots of people in a certain field of work. An internship is a great way to become more confident in the workplace. This increase in confidence will also help a great deal when it comes to the first interview for your first paid job. Activity book. Revision B, page 54, exercise 2. There's a system of language tests which international students should pass, and most universities require level 6 as a minimum. It depends on the course. OK, so let's say you've got that. What happens next? Well, there's a central organisation that coordinates the applications. You apply online through their website. Do you apply for your favourite course? Ah, well, yes, but it's more than that. You can apply for a maximum of five courses. You don't have to apply for five, but you can, and most people do. At different universities? Yes, usually. What about interviews? I heard you have to have an interview. Well, you do sometimes, but not always. It depends on the course and the university. Oh, I see. Um, well... Then what happens? Well, at that point, most people haven't done their final end of school exams. They usually take them after they've applied to university. Oh, that's strange. I know. A lot of people think the same. Anyway, while they're waiting for their results, they start getting replies from the universities they've chosen. I don't understand. If they haven't got their results, how can they get replies? Well, the replies might say, no thanks. They are rejected. Or they might say, yes, definitely. That usually only happens if the students have already done their exams and have got their end of school exam results. What happens if you don't know your results yet? Well, yes, that's the most common situation. You get what they call a conditional offer. That means the university tells you the grades you must get to be admitted. Oh, I see. That's complicated. Well, not really. Your school helps you, of course. Well, thanks. I'll tell my cousin. Activity book. Test B. Page 60. Listening. And now, as part of our global education series, here is a quick history of one of the world's oldest and most respected universities. The University of Al Karawiyin is the oldest existing educational institution in the world, as well as being the only one to have stayed open continually. In addition to all this, it awarded the very first degree. It was founded as a mosque and religious school in 859 CE in Fez, Morocco, by Fatima al-Fihri 
and subsequently became one of the leading spiritual and educational centers in the ancient Muslim world. Along with learning the Quran and Fiqh, students could also learn grammar, rhetoric, logic, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, history, geography, and music. The high quality of teaching and the variety of subjects drew scholars and students from all over the Muslim world and beyond. It is said that Arabic numerals and the idea of zero were first introduced to Europe from here. Today, teaching at the Al Karawiyin University concentrates on the Islamic religious and legal sciences as well as classical Arabic, and its well-founded reputation still goes before it. Teacher's book, Test B, listening. Good morning and congratulations on graduating from high school. I know how hard all of you here today have worked to achieve your very best, but I want to remind you that learning does not stop here. Learning is a part of life which exists beyond the walls of this school. What drives forward this learning? The answer is curiosity. Throughout human history, people have had to discover things using their eyes, ears, and minds. Without computers, without technology. They have looked at the world around them and wanted to find out more, and there is always more to discover. There is always more to learn. Please remember this: I want you to be proud of what you have achieved, of where curiosity has got you so far. But I also want you to know how far it can take you. Your potential is infinite. Literature spot A, page eighty one. I remember, I remember, by Thomas Hood. I remember, I remember, the house where I was born, the little window where the sun came peeping in at morn. He never came a wink too soon, nor brought too long a day. But now I often wish the night had borne my breath away. I remember, I remember, the roses red and white, the violets and the lily cups. Those flowers made of light. The lilacs where the robin built and where my brother set the laburnum on his birthday. The tree is living yet. I remember, I remember where I was used to swing, and thought the air must rush as fresh to swallows on the wing. My spirit flew in feathers then that is so heavy now, and summer pools could hardly cool the fever on my brow. I remember, I remember the fir trees dark and high. I used to think their slender tops were close against the sky. It was a childish ignorance, but now 'tis little joy to know I'm farther off from heaven than when I was a boy. Literature spot A, page eighty-two. All the world's a stage, by William Shakespeare, from As You Like It, Act Two, Scene Six. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school, then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard. Jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth, and then the justice, in fair round belly with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part, into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose. Well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice, turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Literature spot A. Page eighty-four. The old man and the sea. 
by Ernest Hemingway. Santiago is an old fisherman in Cuba, but for the last 84 days he hasn't caught any fish. His friend, a young fisherman named Manolin, helps him to bring in his empty boat every day. Manolin has been Santiago's fishing partner for years. Santiago had taught him all about fishing and has done so since he was a boy of five years old. Now the young man's parents want him to fish with a more productive partner. The next morning, Santiago leaves early and sails far out to sea to try his luck again. Eventually, he feels a bite on one of his hooks and he works out that it must be a big fish, perhaps a marlin. The fish is strong though and does not come up to the surface. Instead, the fish swims away, dragging the old man and his boat along. This goes on until the sun goes down, and eventually Santiago can't see the land anymore at all. As night falls, he wraps the fishing line around himself and goes to sleep, leaving his left hand on the rope to wake him if the marlin surfaces. Soon the old man is asleep, dreaming of the lions he used to see when he was a boy in Africa. Santiago is awoken in the night when he feels the marlin pulling on the line in his hand. The marlin leaps out of the water and Santiago has to hold onto the line with all his strength to avoid being pulled into the sea. When he sees the fish at last, he is amazed by its size. After a long and difficult struggle, he manages to pull it closer to the boat and he kills it. Santiago ties the marlin's body to his boat and prepares to sail home. Before he reaches land, though, he is attacked by several sharks. He kills one with a harpoon and another with his knife. The blood in the water attracts more sharks. Santiago has to beat them away with a club and is badly injured himself. When he arrives back at the harbour, everyone is asleep. Arriving home, Santiago collapses on his bed in exhaustion and falls asleep. The next morning... Manolin finds Santiago in his hut and cries over the old man's injuries. Manolin reassures Santiago that the great fish didn't beat him and that they will fish together again. He tells him that the old man still has much to teach him. That afternoon, some tourists see the marlin skeleton and ask a waiter what it is. Trying to explain what happened to the marlin, the waiter replies, Shark! The tourists misunderstand and assume that is what the skeleton is. They don't realise that it is actually a marlin, the biggest fish ever caught in the village, at more than five metres long. Meanwhile, Santiago is sleeping, and once again, dreaming of the lions he saw in Africa long ago, when he was young. Literature Spot B Page 86 A Green Cornfield by Christina Rossetti The earth was green, the sky was blue. I saw and heard one sunny morn A skylark hang between the two, A singing speck above the corn. A stage below in gay accord, White butterflies danced on the wing, And still the singing skylark soared, And silent sank and soared to sing. The cornfield stretched a tender green to right and left beside my walks. I knew he had a nest unseen somewhere among the million stalks. And as I paused to hear his song while swift the sunny moments slid, perhaps his mate sat listening long and listened longer than I did. Literature Spot B, pages 87 to 88. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne The story, set in 1873 CE, is about an Englishman, Mr. Phileas Fogg, who is trying to complete a journey around the world in 80 days. At this point in the story, he and his travelling companion, the Frenchman, Mr. Passepartout, are travelling through India by train. They have befriended another traveller, Sir Francis Cromarty. The train stopped at eight o'clock in the midst of a glade some fifteen miles beyond Rotha. 
where there were several bungalows and workmen's cabins. The conductor, passing along the carriages, shouted, Passengers will get out here. Where are we? asked Sir Francis. At the hamlet of Colby. Do we stop here? Certainly, the railway isn't finished. What? Not finished? No, there's still a matter of 50 miles to be laid from here to Allahabad, where the line begins again. Yet you sell tickets from Bombay to Calcutta? retorted Sir Francis, who was growing warm. No doubt, replied the conductor. But the passengers know that they must provide means of transportation for themselves from Colby to Allahabad. Sir Francis, said Mr. Fogg quietly, we will, if you please, look about for some means of conveyance to Allahabad. Mr. Fogg, this is a delay greatly to your disadvantage. No, Sir Francis, it was foreseen. What? You knew that the way? Not at all. But I knew that some obstacle or other would sooner or later arise on my route. Nothing, therefore, is lost. I have two gained days to sacrifice. A steamer leaves Calcutta for Hong Kong at noon on the 25th. This is the 22nd, and we shall reach Calcutta in time. There was nothing to say to so confident a response. Mr. Fogg and Sir Francis Cromarty, after searching the village from end to end, came back without having found anything. I shall go afoot, said Phileas Fogg. Passepartout, who had now rejoined his master, made a wry grimace as he thought of his magnificent but too frail Indian shoes. After a moment's hesitation, he said, Monsieur, I think I have found a means of conveyance. What? An elephant. An elephant that belongs to an Indian who lives but a hundred steps from here. Let's go and see the elephant, replied Mr. Fogg. They soon reached a small hut. Enclosed within some high palings was the animal in question. An Indian came out of the hut and, at their request, conducted them within the enclosure. The elephant, which was reared, not to be an animal that merely carried things around, but for warlike purposes, was half domesticated. Happily, however, for Mr. Fogg, the animal's instruction in this direction had not gone far and the elephant still preserved its natural gentleness. Kayuni, this was the name of the elephant, could doubtless travel rapidly for a long time, and, in default of any other means of conveyance, Mr. Fogg resolved to hire him. However, elephants are far from being cheap in India as they are becoming scarce. Male elephants, as they are only suitable for circus shows, are much sought after, especially as the majority are domesticated. When, therefore, Mr. Fogg proposed to the Indian to hire Kayuni, he refused point-blank. Mr. Fogg persisted, offering the excessive sum of ten pounds an hour for the loan of the elephant to Allahabad. Refused. Twenty pounds? Refused also. Forty pounds? Still refused. Phileas Fogg, without getting in the least flurried, then proposed to purchase the animal outright, and at first offered a thousand pounds for him. The Indian, perhaps thinking he was going to make a great bargain, still refused. At two thousand pounds, the Indian yielded. What a price, good heavens! cried Passepartout. For an elephant. It only remained now to find a guide, which was comparatively easy. A young Parsi with an intelligent face offered his services, which Mr. Fogg accepted, promising so generous a reward as to materially stimulate his zeal. The elephant was led out and equipped. Provisions were purchased at Colby, and while Sir Francis and Mr. Fogg took the howdahs on either side, Passepartout got astride the saddlecloth between them. The Parsi perched himself on the elephant's neck, and at nine o'clock they set out from the village, the animal marching off through the dense forest of the palms by the shortest cut.